Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. I am very excited. I recently found a programmer that is going to help me build this game that I designed and I'm currently working on one, you know, like the demo level and I haven't actually done any of the materials yet. I'm still just laying out the UVs, but part of it is going to involve having to run through this gigantic pinball machine area where there's this, you know, these mines that are sort of bouncing back and forth on these bumpers. And one of the things that I could do while I was laying out the UVs was to set up the animations for this part of the level. Now, the thing about this, uh, compared to any of the other animations that I've done, is that these UVs aren't actually laid out sequentially. If we take a look at the actual UV sheet for those bumpers, these colors here that we see are, are these solid bits, the, the bits that aren't animated. You know, they just change color, that's all they do, so they just, they just stay solid. But these animated guys are actually these UVs right in here. And because they're laid out on a sheet the way I actually need them laid out on a sheet, and it's not a tiled material, in order to get these to run in sequence, I have to find a workaround that's gonna let me have a, a, an animation that doesn't require tiling. So each one of those little, little arrows is not actually lined up one next to the other. They're on different spots of the UV sheet, and I have to make them sequential through the functions that I create, as opposed to just letting something run along a, a timeline. And I figured that even though, you know, you're not really interested in the custom materials I'm making for my bumpers, that the way that we got these to sequence is something that's really good to learn. And in fact, it builds off of something we've learned already, namely how to use a wave to get fancy animations. Okay, so here we are in the test material that I made, and, and it's not, well, there's no material. I mean, all this is is the animation. I mean, there's, there's nothing going on in here because we're not really going to deal with that. But one of the things that I've got going on here is that I've created in my Photoshop masks that correspond directly to those very spots that I want to do. You may have something that you already want to sequence, in which case you're going to need a black and white mask for every single one of the colors that you want to put in that sequence. In this case, I have five of them, and then we, we're making a sixth one that's, that, comes, that deals with this flash at the end. So that's, that flash is our sixth, which we're just combining a bunch of masks. And then the sequence, each one of these needs its own black and white mask. So if you have something, by all means, go ahead and use it. Create your bitmaps. I'm using these at 512, which is the smallest size I could get them to look good. Because again, it's only, it's only emissive, so I, I can get away with a smaller size. But you know, the, the less weight you send in here, the easier it becomes to animate it. And whether you create them at 512, or I happen to create them at 2K, and then I just drop them down to 512 here. To import them, just to remind everybody, I right-click on my file, and I link a bitmap. And that's how I got this 3D object in here as well. Except that time, I went link 3D mesh. And then in order to get that 3D mesh to appear in here, I just double click on this and it's going to send it into my window and I right click on my graph, view outputs in 3D view and that will send whatever material you have coming out of here onto the 3D mesh that you put in here. Now because it's really not going to make any sense just visually for us to check it on a regular cube. I'm going to keep all my stuff in here, and that means I have to keep my masks in here as well. 
if you want to follow along with the lesson and you don't have a particular thing in mind and you just want to play along, instead of these bitmaps that I have here, what I suggest you do is let's find a shape. Now we'll stick with a square. And I'll put it into this transform. And I can make this smaller. I'm holding down Alt and Shift, and that's going to just bring it to the middle. Oh, you know, we forgot to do. Let's come in here and make it not tile. So I'm going into tiling mode, absolute, no tiling. And you can make a series of these. So I'm going to save myself having to change that size. You can just move these guys around. So each one's different. And, you know, set them up in a sequential order of some sort and replace them here. I'm not going to do that, but you can you can do something along those lines. You don't even need this. Um, and the rest of it, uh, yeah, once you do that, you'll you'll be able to follow along because everything rests on these masks. So I'm going to continue to use them, even though we're going to make a new material. But you can go ahead and do this, or if you've already got something that you want to make happen, then go back into your Photoshop and create an individual mask for each one of these things that you want to have a color. So like some of the, like there's, there's one less circle than there are arrows, and, but they share colors. So like my, my green one, my green circle and my green arrow are the same mask. My red circle and my red arrow are the same mask, etc. So get it so that your colors, one mask per color. All right. Now we're going to make a new material. And we'll call this sequence. And because I've already got my stuff here, I can go ahead and import those in. Now, this is... Um, my static emissives those are the one those are these um pipes that don't change color so we'll deal with that later we're not going to deal with those now and we have all of these need to turn into grayscales there okay so the other thing we want to do is get this set up we've already got this temporary mesh in here but it's still getting this information uh, we're going to change some stuff around first. We're not going to use a normal. So I'm going to switch this to an emissive because I'm lazy. And I'm going to call it emissive. Put it up there because that's where I like it. Uh, I'm going to set these up too. I'm going to get a gray scale and kind of like a middling gray in here. And we can use that for our roughness and our metallic. I mean, we don't have to have a metallic. I think it's kind of cool. Makes it easier on the eye. Uh, we don't need a height. We can just get rid of that. And now we're still not seeing any of this in here. I'm going to right click, view outputs in 3D view, and it's all gone to black. So it's kind of this middle black. Right. The first thing we want to work out is that basic sequence. Now you'll notice that there's a couple of things happening here. We have an emissive that is just one at a time. And then behind it, there's a trail of color that adds into it. And we'll deal with that later. So you have this emissive progression, and then it flashes once it's done doing its emissive thing. And once it's done doing the progression, so it goes there, it goes back, and then it flashes. And we'll get that going first. Now, let's come back to this original one first. And I just kind of want to show you a little trick well, it's not a little trick. It's something that I've only recently, like literally a few days ago, started looking at in the um, in here. And this is our multi-material blend. Now, I've got two multi-material blends here. One of them is a grayscale. One of them is a color. They're both working off of the exact same color mask. This one down here is going to be dealing with our base color and it's going to get that color progression going for us, whereas this one is dealing straight up with the emissive. And they're, and they're working off of the same color mask, so these two always have to be exactly the same. And we end up with 
seven materials on here because we're going to leave material one blank because I want that to be my black background. I always want that black background. And that first one, that material one, is always going to be your background. You'll notice that these only start at material two. Now in here I've chosen the emissive channel and I've turned everything else off because this is going to be, this doesn't have to be there. Oh, that's the one on top. I'm looking at the one on top. Did I just ruin that for myself? No. I was looking at this one. I want to be looking at this one. This has got the emissive and this one's got the height. And that's a lot of channels to juggle because each one of these has its own color. Let's get a multi-material blend in here. We're actually in the wrong material. Let's just, we'll just take a quick look at it in here. Each one of those materials in here has a color. In here, I've turned it into something that they all share. And that's what we're going to do first because it's going to allow us to be 100% consistent in the, in the colors that these two use. And you get to learn something kind of cool and new, which I'm going to experiment with a bit more because it's got a lot of possibilities. And that is in the actual input parameters that we're going to create right now for our material colors. So I'll call this material two. I'm going to make it a float three and I'm going to make the default 255, zero and zero. We're going to have the zero as the minimum and 255 as the maximum. We can turn this into a slider and we're going to put in the word false invisible if and let me show you why. Before we go any further with making any more of these, because it's going to save me some work just in the demo of it, let's set this up and publish it out. We're going to make this one our grayscale, so we'll just have it be height. And let's put material 2 in here. I'm going to get this temporary transform 2D node. Actually, we're going to, we're going to put it in the base color, it doesn't matter. I'm going to plug it into, yeah, it's height, so I'm going to have to get one of those. It doesn't mind having a grayscale. It minds having something that's been designated as height. Okay, so we've got this temporary thing set up so I can show you what that false does. And let's publish this, and we'll call it sequence. And we can come back in here and open up sequence. Now, there's nothing going on in here. But there's nothing going on in here either. Now, let's remove that false. I should have probably shown it the other way around. Because if we have an input parameter in here, you know, whether you're using it in the final product or not, it's going to show up in here. So I can you know, change the color of material 2 in here right now. But that's not something I ever want the end user to have to use. I mean, this is something for me to keep my colors straight because I'm using the same thing for like a multiple number of material maps. And I was just monkeying around with it actually while I was doing this because I was like, wow, there's got to be a way of shutting that off. And there absolutely is. There's documentation on the Substance webpage if you want more information on it. I haven't really looked at it yet, but I certainly plan on exploring this in the future as far as lessons go because I think this is great. It, it allows you to have functions that you can essentially use internally and then you can turn them off for the end user. So we're going to be doing that and I kind of wanted to show you that before I went and made a bunch of these because it's a lot easier to turn off. Right. So we've, we've made this first one. And now all we really need to do is just copy it out. So we're going to make a copy and then we're going to make a bunch of new ones. But we've got to make sure that each color is completely different. Now, I mean, this would make it different, but that's kind of a pain. So I'm going to try to keep to my very basic colors for as long as I can. Okay. Wait, got to do that, right. So now I can come in here into my multi-material blend. I can get myself seven channels and I can start just assigning colors to the appropriate, you know, just making sure that this matches up with this. 
and this way I'm going to stay consistent regardless of whether I'm using this grayscale one or I'm going to just copy this, save myself the trouble, I hit control D. I'm going to get rid of this noodle first or it's going to screw everything up and I'm going to change the channels and I'm going to make the emissive true and I'm going to make the height false. If you leave a noodle in here, it's going to leave the legacy one and it won't let you get, a, you know, won't let you get rid of it. So we now have our two multi-material blends. Um, I'm going to make sure I get my animation in the right order. Yeah, you know, let me go back and check in my original what order I had these in. Yeah, so they are in the right order. So I had them set up like this. I mean, the only difference... Oh, number two, it, got, it needs to go in the number two spot. I mean, the only difference is the direction it's going to go, it, it, and that's the direction I decided I wanted. And for now, we don't have anything in the seven spot because we're going to make that later. That's going to be our flash. So let's work on this sequential bit first. Okay, we are ready to actually make our function. Okay, so we're using these multi-material blends which have a color ID mass. And we just assigned those input parameters to each one of these spots. So if that exact color shows up in the color ID, that's the mask that's going to get spat out of here. So we need to create a function on top of a uniform color. We're going to make this color change according to a wave. And you know, we have touched on this before. I did a video where you could just switch directions with a wave. And this works on exactly the same principle, only it's more involved. And I will demonstrate visually because I think it's probably easiest to see what we're going to be doing. Okay, so we've got our Y, we've got our X. And the wave goes from 0 to 1 through 0. So this is 1, this is negative 1 and this is zero, and it, all it does is just pass back and forth through here. Now, when we did that direction switch, we, we said if it's over zero, it's one thing, if it's under zero, it's the other thing. But there's like a bajillion numbers in between here, and there's a completely different set of bajillion numbers in between here. So you can actually get this to be really persnickety, and we're not going to get super duper persnickety with it, but we are going to start to utilize all of those various floats in between. So we're going to go into output color and we're going to create an empty function. And we're going to start building our graph. So the first thing I'm going to want is my wave. I'm pretty sure it defaults to one, but we're going to put that number one in there for our frequency and our amplitude. And feel free to mess around with that. Well, with the frequency, not the amplitude, because we are actually dealing with the amplitude. Okay, I'm going to get a greater than, and I'm going to make a bunch of copies. And I'm also going to get a float, and I'm going to make a bunch of copies. And then we're just going to start set, oh yeah, you know, and also while we're making bunches of copies, we might as well make a bunch of copies of these if-elses. And... This is all actually pretty straightforward. It's just we're imagining this wave going up and down, up and down between 1 and negative 1. Right now, we're going to only be dealing... Well, you know, let's do it the other way around. Let's start at, at the top. I didn't make copies of this. Oh, yeah, I did. I put them over on the side. Okay. I've got these five spots here. So I want to break this wave up into equal bits. So I've got the number between 0 and 0.2, that's 2. Then I've got two spots between 0.2 and 0.4. Then I've got two spots between 0.4 and 0.6 and 0.8. And I don't have to do, I mean, 1 is implied because we're doing greater than. So it's not going to get bigger than 1. So 0.8 to 0.1 is that, you know, the, the parabolic arc, if you will, of that, of the wave. So it is going to be a little bit longer. I mean, you can do the math. Me, personally, I don't really care. 
I think it looks fine. I was doing it visually. But that's the principle behind it. So we've got X amount of spots, and now I'm chopping that wave, and it's going to hit it on the way up, and it's going to hit it on the way down. Right. If our wave is greater than 0.2, Again, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my notes. I, I did it at the top. It's just easier conceptually to do it this way for me. Okay. If the wave, yeah, if the wave is greater than 0.8, then I want material 1. That's why I did it because that's the direction that I have it. I uh, Material 2, rather. This is just setting up the order of the way the lights flash. So I had, I had made the decisions just artistically how I wanted it to go, and this is how I set it up. The order in which you have these things is entirely up to you. But you're assigning a particular color ID color to a 0.2 spread within the positive part of this arc. Right. But this wants a float 4, and if we come back into here and we look at our input parameters, we made them float 3 because this thing wants a float 3. It's got no alpha in this color, so it, it wants a, a float 3 here, but this result wants a float 4. So we're actually going to have to vector these into a float 4. And the thing that we're adding is the alpha, and that's just going to be a constant 255 because we want it on all the time. And so we can kind of duplicate those out as well. And now all we have to do is bring those colors in. So we've got our variable get float 3. I'm going to start with material 2. So I'm going to vector material 2 is my 3 RGB channels plus my alpha is going to be the result if the wave is between 0.8 and 1. So as it goes through that arc, this is the color that that color ID will show. Okay, so we can do the next one now. I'm just going to, you know what, let's get rid of this, and we'll just duplicate this whole bit out. I'm going to change this to material 3, because this stays the same, and all we need to do is change the instructions. So if, oops, got that wrong, if wave is bigger than 0.6, but by inference smaller than 0.8, then material 3 gets put up as the color in the color ID and so on. And we forgot to do zero. Okay, so if material two is on, then we do this. We just daisy chain these guys up. And this last one I think by default it would just be black, but I'm not sure. We're going to want this later anyway. I'm just going to make it black. So, material 6. And we'll put that as the output node. And fingers crossed, it works. It's always best when you actually hook it up. Let's try that again. There we go. So it goes out, it hangs for a little bit longer on that parabolic arc, it comes back, but as it drops below zero, nothing happens. And that's because we've reserved that part for, for something else. We could very easily, just to, you know, proof of concept here, I can put in an absolute in here, and we can publish it out again. And I've made it absolute, so it's now reading the negatives as positives, and it's just giving it an, you know, like an even thing. So if that's, if that's the effect you want, there you go. But I want to take that empty space, and I want to put something else in there. Uh, and this allows me to mix up patterns. Now, what I'm doing here, you know, between 0 and negative 1, I've left this big space, but conceptually, again, you can decide that, well, between 0.2 and 0.4, something else is going to happen. You can go ahead and make that happen. And we're going to make this happen with a different wave. So I'm going to come back into my library. I'm going to get another wave. And I'm going to set this wave 
well, a different amplitude, certainly. And, but I'm also going to create an input parameter for the frequency because this is going to determine that frequency is going to determine how quickly it flashes. And I'm going to make the amplitude 0.5 because I just want to quicken everything up. I don't want it to have to travel quite so far. So that quickens it up. But I also want to give the end user the ability to make that flash faster or slower beyond this 0.5. So let's come back into here and create another input parameter. And we'll call this flash frequency. And that's going to be a float one. Uh, I'm not going to put a group for now. I don't know what the, I had as the default. Uh, we're going to want the maximum more than, oh, let's make it 10. We're going to, the maximum needs to be more than one. Um, I suppose if you want to turn the flash off, we can have it be zero. Right, that's good enough for now. Let's come back in here, and we could go ahead and bring that variable in here. I'm going to bring this zero out here because we're going to reuse it for here. So now we're going to set up a completely different set of instructions for what happens below zero. All right, so let's get another greater then. And now we're, we're not talking about this wave anymore, we're talking about this wave. So if this wave is greater than zero, oops, sorry, I did that wrong. If this wave is greater than zero, then I want material seven, because this is our flash, right? It's gonna make it confusing. I'm going to separate that out. So material 7, we do want this though, plus that vectored alpha. So if this wave is greater than 0, then we get whatever color is put out by this mask. Otherwise, we get black, and then we just replace that black with that. Now, we've set it up in here. We haven't set it up in here. It's still blank in here. And I'm going to set up the pattern that I want. So I've got these five pieces to choose from, and I'm going to decide, well, which, one, which ones of them do I want to flash at the same time? So I'm going to do every other one. Let's get this to be a light and blend. So I'm going to do the, that one and that one. Then we can duplicate this and go with the last one, and that's going to give me every other one and we can plug that in there. Fingers crossed. I'm going to stop this so we can get to the beginning. So it starts at zero. There's nothing going on. It's going to come out. It's going to go back. And it's not flashing. Let's find out why. You know, it, 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 it does work. I just misremembered the direction that the flash frequency was going. This has to be a big number. Uh, we had it set so low that nothing was happening because I came back in here. And so if it's at the default, which is 1, nothing happens. But then I brought this all the way up to 10. Because one flash takes longer than the period of time it has between this first wave's 0 and negative 1. So let's take this variable and bracket it so that people can't make that happen. So we're going to find a minimum for starters. So let's come back into here and find a minimum we like. So I think it should be higher than that. So let's try five. So five will give us two flashes. How about eight? I want three flashes. It's too much, so six. Okay, so I, I want that to be my default. So we'll make the floor six, and we'll do it between six and ten, because I think ten will probably be about as much as we want. Yeah, so let's do that. I'm going to make the default 6. We'll make the minimum 6. And we'll, we, we won't clamp it so that we can always change it if we want it. We'll leave that. I don't want to get too persnickety with that. All right. So that was easily fixed. And that's the basic thing done. And that's the sequence that's going to drive 
the emissives and it's going to be the basis for the one that we're going to use for the color except we're going to do some cool stuff with the color and let's come back to the original here I want to be able to create a material you know, let's republish this out again I just want to demonstrate it on here so let's open sequence test I've got this set up so you know we've got the basic animation going but I want to be able to have this go to be more or less monochromatic so that's like a zero hue spread and then to also be able to control the degree to which it cycles hue so if I bring this number low it's gonna stick pretty close to its original color which I can set here so if I want a more or less monochromatic thing going on where there's very little change I set these numbers low and the hue spread is talking about the the spread within each one of you know like within the each element and then the hue cycle range is talking about how the whole thing cycles through the HSL thing so if you set it all the way up it's going to do the full range and if you set the hue spread up it's going to have the most difference in the hues between the various elements and that's why I showed you on the original because that would have been really hard to explain without having done it already so you know we got some things going on and, it, and it's kind of cool because it means you can you can change it and have it respond to all sorts of external stimuli like people I don't know I haven't gotten to that part yet but all of this stuff you know can be adjusted in game so this can respond to things that are going on as far as your gameplay is concerned also you know it just gives that functionality right so let's make it now let's start by making some input parameters and we need a hue spread and that's going to be a float one and we can make this part of a color group and we can leave it at default I'm actually going to copy it to save a little time and we'll make our hue range uh, it's going to be more or less the same thing and finally we want our base color also and that's going to be a float four and let, I'm going to make the default red this red at the very beginning just so you know it's at this end of the hue range but it doesn't really matter right so let's start with the beginning so we'll make this our base color now I want to create a color for each one of my little things here and I want them to be all related to each other within a certain hue distance and so I'm gonna do this by function and it's also gonna let me tighten up that hue spread if I want it or not so this is gonna be a super simple little function let's come in here empty function and I had chosen 0.1 as my multiplier because obviously we're going through 0 and 1 and in reality it's 0 and 0.5 because halfway through brings you back to the beginning again so if we get hue spread here and we multiply it by 0.1 and make this our output node every time I make another one of these and I send the result of the previous node into it it's going to bump it up by 0.1 multiplied by whatever my hue spread is so right now I've got it set to 1 let's just build this first so we got we need five of them all together and that brings us back to the beginning but if we come back into our input parameter and take a look at it there and I start bringing this number down those colors start getting closer and closer and closer to each other in hue as I bring that slider down because that multiplier is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and that's how that works but we still haven't really turned them into anything we got we got the colors but we don't have 
what they're actually coloring. And we're going to need some blend notes for that. But we've already got it all set up because we've got the masks here. So we've got, I'm going to go in like this. So one, I'm going to make some copies and we're just going to go down the line and make these correspond to the ones on, uh, on top. Check that. Now, I want the color, and again, this is a personal choice here. I want the colors to progress. So I want first only one, then I want, I don't want this one to disappear, and I wanted to add it onto the next one. So I'm going to use this as the background, and then this is the mask for the next one. So I'll put that on top and continue down the line. So by the time we get to the end, they're all piled up there. So we've got all the colors now at the end. I'll put it out this way. And that's what we hook up to our multi-material blend. Oh, wait, did that wrong. We want this as our background. So there, that's the, the progression. And then I'm going to pick a color that I want to have happen for my flash. So, you know, I can pick any one of these colors. I, I want this one. And that's the color that's going to get used for when these guys are going. All right. So we've got the basic setup for both our color and our emissive at this point, And it's just a question of setting it up. Now, I also have my static emissive here. This is just a color mask for the solid ones. There's, there's absolutely nothing here for you to see. I'm just going to quickly do this. I'm going to assign each one of these a color. So let's go duplicate this guy. I'm going to turn this into a color channel instead of an emissive channel. This is only to make those pipes. This has got nothing to do really with what we're doing. I'm just going to mix it in just because it's pretty. And I'm going to assign a color to each one of these guys. Um, I seem to be missing something here. Two, three, four. Oh, I guess I am missing something because I, I doubled up on that one. Right, and let's just blend these together. So I'm going to make my emissive now. This is the just the mask for the things that aren't animated. And we're going to use our animated mask for the colors that are coming out of here. So whatever color is under that black and white mask is what's going to show up, and only that for the emissive. And then... I'm going to just combine that with the static. So that's our basic emissive. And we kind of do the same thing for the color. But we don't need to combine it with, um, with any of this stuff. So I'm just going to do this. And one of the things that I did, and again, you don't, you don't have to do this. I just kind of wanted to separate out, actually I had it in, I have an extra blend note here for some reason. I'm just going to bring the hue down a little bit. I mean the, the saturation down a little bit. This is going to be the color only. So the color that is coming out of here, which is like all of the pieces. So all this stuff. You want them super bright. That's great. I just want to kind of make a bit more of a contrast between what's going on with the emissive, which is going to stay bright because it's not coming through this desaturation in here and then have the color be a little bit more desaturated. So that's going to go in here and that's going to go in here. Get rid of that. 
So that's emitting, that's doing its thing. Let's publish this out and see if that functions. Oh, something's wrong. Let's take a look. That's because we didn't take care of the flash in here. Yeah, we just got this color going straight up in there. We forgot to c cut that out. That's not what I wanted. Let's bring a blend node in here. We're going to bring the color into here, and we are going to cut out. And then that goes into the number seven spot. And that should work a bit better. We can change the base color. And we've got our hue spread. So the only thing we're missing now is that hue range, right? And that's what we're going to put right here at the very end. So again, it's a, a hue saturation node, and they're going to be both exactly the same, so we can work on this one. So we're going to come into the hue. Now we know that we're we really only going to deal with half of it, because all it does is go ahead and repeats itself. And because it is a, it is a cycle, we are going to be using a wave for this. But I'm only going to have it with an amplitude of 5 because, well, actually, no, I'm going to have it with a frequency of 5. That's going to be the constant, sorry. The amplitude is what we're going to be changing. So I don't want it bigger than 5. I, I want it to run between 0. Th the wave is it's still running between 0 and 0.5. Ooh, why is that a 5? That should be a 0.5. But I want it to also be able to go smaller than that. So I'm going to multiply this 0.5 by my hue cycle range. So if that is 1, then it's going to be at this largest, which is 0.5. Otherwise, it's going to be a number smaller than that. And that should be pretty much all of it at this point. Let's take a look. Oh, so something's not hooked up. Oh. Always works better when you hook it up, and we're going to have to make two of them. Let's try that again. Okay, so the hue spread working. We've got the hue range. It's running through the hues. It's doing what it needs to do. I can change this, which is essentially changing its starting point. It This becomes important if you bring this all the way down. And this is how you would change your color. Right, so I think that is uh, pretty well done. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this was my project, but I thought that the mechanics behind it is actually probably something that's pretty useful, and it can be applied to a bunch of different things. It doesn't have to be colors. It can be anything. But, you know, taking those waves and being able to chop up a wave in a variety of different ways and to have it do different things at different portions inside that wave, so... That can be applied to a bunch of different stuff. So I hope that was helpful, and I'll see you in the next video.